Cool. Uh, in that case, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. So what I'm going to be talking about in essence is framing and characterization in debates. Uh, the workshop is largely going to be focused on various tips, tricks and heuristics you can use, be it in prep or in debates, to make your framing stronger. I'm going to try to give examples of as many different uh, scenarios from various tournaments and motions I've debated, uh, to, just to clarify and to uh, paint a picture of what exactly it is I'm talking about. Uh, obviously, there is a chat because this is Zoom, so it means if anyone has any questions during the uh, workshop, feel free to post them here. I'm going to answer either immediately or I'm just going to try to integrate the answer somewhere where it fits. And obviously, you can ask questions afterwards as well. Everyone is also welcome to contact me on my Facebook uh, and, all, and all of those things. Cool. So let's get started. So in terms of framing and characterization, the first question we have to ask ourselves is what even is that? I.e., what is the difference between framing and argumentation? So when we talk about arguments, giving arguments for or against a motion, arguments are in essence reasons to propose or oppose a motion. They're statements which provide us with reasoning as to why something is true or is not true, i.e. arguments are tools for proof. Whereas on the other hand, framing and characterization is value neutral. It refers to claims about, for example, a location or an actor or a phenomenon that are not a reason to propose or oppose a motion in and of themselves, but are rather descriptive statements about something. So for example, if I'm characterizing the current political situation in Iran, uh, there was a motion about Iran today at the tournament I judged, so that's why Iran popped to mind. I'm going to say we have a volatile situation in Iran. There have been protests. Iran is under sanctions. Uh, Trump has pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. None of the things I just said is a reason for anything. These are just facts about Iran, which describe the world in which the debate is happening if the debate is happening in Iran. Fr uh, framing can also refer to meta claims about the motion or the debate. For example, if there is a this house regrets motion, that requires me to provide a counterfactual as the opening government. It means if I regret the existence of ice cream, I would have to provide a counterfactual world, how do I, I, e, I, have, I would have to explain how the world looks without ice cream. Again, this is not a reason. This is not me explaining why we should be for or against the motion. This is me making a claim about the particular debate. So when you say the burden of government or opposition in this debate is to do X, Y, Z, or when you say, given that this is a this house would motion, we have the fiat to implement the model. All of these are claims which are true about the debate taking place, but are not argumentation. So in essence, the primary difference between argumentation and framing slash characterization is that framing is value neutral. It, in essence, is setting the battleground for the debate. So you can think of it like it's an, like an analogy when like there are medieval battles and stuff like this. So before the battle happens, you first need to have a battleground, a battlefield. Framing and characterization is setting up the battlefield, choosing the battlefield which is most beneficial to you. And this enters the answer to the question of why does framing and characterization matter? Because it makes your arguments more or less likely. Arguments and theoretical claims are more or less likely depending on the world in which they happen. So for example, if we are talking about sanctioning a particular country, let's say um, a few years ago when there was the Russian invasion of Crimea, there were very popular motions about sanctioning Russia. Now we have motions on whether we should remove the sanctions on Russia. It's far easier to argue for sanctions if you can frame Russia in such a way as to claim that Russia has no choice but to concede to our demands because sanctions are making Russia too weak. To do that, you would have to describe the state of the Russian economy. You would have to explain which channels of influence, which vectors uh, in terms of like political the situation, in terms of like the social situation are currently present in Russia in order to make the claim. These in and of themselves are not reasons to keep sanctioning Russia. You'd probably make arguments like we want Russia to, uh, I don't know, uh, support human rights more, or we want Russia to ensure that minorities in Russia are respected or whatever. But in order for you to provide the mechanism for the impact of those reasons, we first have to explain why sanctions work. To explain that, we have to explain why the debate happens in a world or in this case, in a country, which is in such a state that sanctions will work on that country. Therefore, this is what I was talking about when I was saying about choosing a battlefield. The same arguments play out in vastly different ways 
depending on whether you can first get the judge to believe that the country you are debating about is in such a state that the motion can work in the first place. Second reason why framing and characterization is incredibly important is because it makes your arguments more resilient. I.e., it means that other teams need to do a lot more legwork to take your arguments down and win the debate. Because if you, for example, characterize the incentives of a particular person or a particular group of people in a certain way, in order for the other side to make the opposite argument, they first have to dismantle your characterization of how actors behave. Because they can make an argument that has a fantastic impact. If proven, it might be a debate-winning argument. But if you have proven preemptively that actors in the motion will not behave in such a way that supports the opposition argument because they have different motivations, because they have different incentives, because they have different emotions, then their argument cannot stand unless they first dismantle your description, your characterization of the actors which are key within the motion. So insofar as you can add context and characterization and framing to the claims you are making, it makes your claims more resilient to attacks from the other side because then they have to contest your view of the world and your description of the world before they can start making their arguments, which is why the difference between a 77 speech and an 82 speech is most often in framing and characterization. Because honestly, in terms of the arguments that teams think of, most top teams don't think of incredibly innovative arguments uh, that nobody else would ever think of and that just uh, blow your mind or something like that. Most people who have debated for like six months or a year, most novices will probably think of the same ideas for arguments on a basic motion as your average team from Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard. The difference is how you construct the world behind those arguments, whether you can construct the world that makes those arguments more likely to be true or less likely to be true. And this is the entire point of framing as a tool. What I'm going to do now is just go, go into a long list of ways and advice in, in which you can do framing and characterization in order to help you guys make it a far easier job for you, especially in stronger groups. So in terms of framing, I'm going to divide framing and characterization into two distinct parts because framing refers more to like, let's say the meta debating part of the game, whereas characterization refers more to uh, descriptions of actors, analysis of their incentives and so on. So in terms of framing, what are useful things to do when framing a debate? The first thing is clearly stating the burdens and the implications of the motion. What does this mean? First of all, you all know that there are different types of motions debating on, uh, uh, depending on the verb in the motion. So this house would differs from this house believes that differs from this house regrets and so on and so forth. These particular verbs imply certain specific burdens. When framing the debate, it is incredibly useful to explicitly state what the motion requires of you to prove and what it doesn't require of you to prove, particularly when you are opening half. Because when you're closing, hopefully opening half will have established that. If they haven't, it is your job to establish that. But this means that if you have a this house regrets motion, it is very useful to explicitly state that this is a counterfactual debate. A good example of this, Cambridge IV, a, lot, a couple of years ago, I don't know, 2014, 2015, there was the motion this house regrets the rise of Xi Jinping. Opposition won the debate by putting forth the following framing. Because government came up and they just like chat a lot about Xi Jinping, that he's horrible, of all the human rights violations he has done, of certain economic missteps he has done. Opposition said for the following frame. They said, look, this is a counterfactual debate. We are happy to agree with everything that government said in terms of why he's a bad ruler. We are, however, going to show that in the counterfactual world, we would have gotten someone who is even worse. And that's how they won. Because they were very explicit about the fact that the burden in this debate is not to prove that actor X is good or bad, but that the world without actor X is better or worse. If you make these burdens explicit in the beginning of your case, say, look, given the motion, given the verb in the motion, this is what is required of us to prove, and this is what is not required of us to prove. Your speeches are far easier to track, and it's far harder for other teams to try to impose false or too heavy burdens on you at the point where they realize that you have a clear picture of what the burdens in the debate are, and they will probably realize that this is not a strategically viable option for them to do. This doesn't just imply to the main verbs in the motion. This implies to being very, this also implies being very explicit about the implications of certain words or quantifiers in the motion. 
So, if, so for example, in the motion th that we, uh, where Bo Seo gave the legendary speech on the Marxist revolution, the motion was that the world's poor are justified in pursuing complete Marxist revolution. It's very useful in that kind of motion to be very explicit about the fact that the word justified implies that you do not have to prove that this revolution will be successful. You do not have to prove that it will lead to good impacts. You just have to prove that it is morally justified. On a normative level, this is something that we can support. Being very explicit about the fact that this is the burden that the motion requires of you makes your speeches far easier to track. A second example of this is at Cape Town, uh, Cape Town Worlds, there was a motion uh, that this, this house believes that the state should heavily disincentivize women from having children. The word heavily implies that the government needs to propose a model which significantly changes the status quo and is strongly punitive, which means that oppositions can call governments out if they have too soft of a model, because the motion implies that we need to talk about significant deviations from the status quo, which are going to create strong harms for people who do not follow the guidelines that we want to set up. Therefore, it is a useful framing for, let's say, the member of the opposition, for the leader of the opposition to say, this motion requires a heavily punitive strategy. If government doesn't propose that, they are not proposing the motion. Do not be afraid to read the implications of the motion out and be explicit about them in the round. Use the motion to your advantage. It identify what your burdens are and what the burdens are of the other teams and tell the judge that those are the burdens. Tell the judge that those are the implications of words in the motion and explain why. Don't just say within this motion, it's our burden to do this. Why is it your burden? Because the motion has this particular word in it or because in this type of motion, you're required to do this by the format. Explain why the motion implies particular burdens and explain why the motion implies particular frames. Don't just state that it does because obviously you want to state that it does because you want like the debate to be favorable to, toward, toward, towards you, but you need to provide reasonings as to why that's true. I think that a very useful tool for doing this very often are analogies. When you want to push a burden onto another team, and, and that's part of very useful framing, to try to make other teams prove things that they don't want to have to prove. So it's very often useful when you want to push a burden on a team. So let's say you want to make them oppose something. You want to find an analogy of something that they probably don't want to oppose and then make it analogous to the thing you want to make them oppose. For example, there is a motion that says, this house believes that religious individuals should elect their religious leaders instead of them being chosen by religious bodies. So this is, for example, all Catholics in the world elect the Pope by popular vote. He's not elected by the College of Cardinals. If you want to make the principal argument that people have a right to choose their religious leader, for example, you can use the analogy of democracy. Why? Because intuitively, most teams would not oppose the idea that people should have control over their lives in a democracy or that people should be able to vote in a democracy. This is something that intuitively no one would oppose unless a motion explicitly forces them to. And then you make the analogy, which goes as follows. I'm going to give the example within the particular motion just so it's clear. The analogy goes as follows. Why do we think that people need to have control over their lives in a democracy? First, because the state is infinitely more powerful than them, insofar as the state decisions impact every single facet and aspect of your life, your education, your welfare, your health care, uh, your right to do certain things, the, the like being forbidden from doing certain things, every single facet of your life, including your private life, is controlled by the state. This is analogous in religion, because insofar as you subscribe to religious texts, which have very explicit commandments that you have to follow based on what we believe in a particular religion that is the word of a god or the word of a prophet, you are at every point in your life, even more so than a state, right? Because religion also passes judgment on your thoughts and emotions, not just on your actions. You are consistently under the yoke of religion and under the control of religion. So this is analogous. If people should control their lives in a state because the state controls every facet of their life. So the only way for them to control their life is to control the state. The same works for religion. Secondly, is the idea that the state has strong coercive mechanisms that it can use against you, right? The state has the army, the state has the police, the state has the judicial system. And because all of these are dangerous 
to individuals when used in an improper way, because the average individual cannot resist the firepower of the state. Individuals need to be able to harness the firepower of the state so as, to, so as the, that firepower is not abused. The analogy works for religion. So because your religious officials, so, you, so the, the, the priest, the, the, the imam and, and the rabbi and so on and so forth, are people who are tasked with guiding you to heaven and guiding you away from hell. They are the ones who provide spiritual guidance as to how your soul remains pure and virtuous. These people can abuse that power. So it means that you need to control the institution that is at the top of the hierarchy, which is the prime religious leader, like the Pope or whoever, in order to be able to harness that power of soul guidance so that that power is not abused. If you are a religious person, the consequence of going to hell instead of to heaven is eternal and therefore even worse than the consequence of the state misusing its power. And finally, the third reason is that you cannot avoid the state. You cannot be stateless. Like you can move in between states, but you are always in a state, which means that you, even if you cannot avoid the state, the only way for you to have control over your destiny is to control the state. Same works for religion. There is no avoiding the eye of God. God is omniscient and omnipotent. He's always above you and so on. If you were to frame, so if you were to frame the argument in that particular way, it would be a lot harder for the opposition to take down that argument. Because if at the end of the argument, you're very explicit in saying, look, if they want to oppose principle of religious individuals controlling their connection to religion through selecting their leaders, they would also have to oppose the fundamental tenets of democracy. Opposition does not just have to disprove your principle. They would also have to disprove the analogy, either prove why it's not analogous, which takes time and effort and analysis, or prove that they oppose both which is even harder. So in essence, you would always, and this is why I said that argumentation and, and, and framing differs. In both worlds, you would, all, you would run the same argument. You would give the same reasons why religious people have the principal right to select their leaders. However, if the argument is framed well, you would accompany each of those reasons in this particular scenario with an analogy, which makes it stronger. Now, this is not to say that you can always win arguments on analogies, nor should you always have analogies, nor should you run six analogies per speech. But analogies are a good example of how you can push burdens onto other teams. Pushing burdens is a very important part of framing insofar as it makes the debate easier for you to win and harder for the other team to win. I see a question in the chat. Let me just see what it is. So yeah, I would say that's the correct interpretation. So I mean, in general, when you are delivering an argument usually you don't just jump to impacts, right? You first start with setting the terrain, contextualizing the actor, giving some kind of incentive analysis, explaining why the motion changes likelihoods, why the motion changes people's behavior. And then based on that, you derive impact. So you always start from setting the ground for the impact and then you move on to the impact. And I think this, this is largely intuitive in terms of how we make arguments because you want to start with like the basic groundwork and then move down to the impact. What I'm just gonna try to do here is try to give you a lot of like advice and various tips on how to do this, how to do this more easily. Okay, the second thing that's very important to do in terms of framing is to be very clear on your advocacy, i.e. what you stand for in the debate and what you do not stand for in the debate. So for example, um, in a debate about, um, obviously that motion is probably not going to be set at the tournament uh, because of obvious reasons, but if there's a motion, um, this house would ban abortion at all stages of pregnancy. I think that was WDC 2011 final or 2012 final. Uh, it was a very good thing for opening government to say, for example, yes, we would ban it apart from cases where there has been sexual assault or when the life of the woman is in danger or something like that. So be very clear on what you do support and what you are willing to stand for and what you are not willing to stand for. The, this amounts to various things. So being clear on what your counterfactual is, like for example, if it's a regrets motion, you're opening government, being very clear on what the counterfactual is, why you stand behind it, why I think it's likely. If it's a this house would motion, clearly defining your model, what would happen in the model and what wouldn't happen in the model and so on and so forth. Because most motions require you to comparatively solve a certain problem. So very often when you're debating about a policy solution and you're trying to explain why the policy solution is, for example, bad or insufficient, what the other team is going to do is they're going to say, 
oh yes, this is flawed, that's true, but we don't have another alternative. If you don't stand for this, what do you stand for? And they're going to try to beat you on the grounds of saying, it's similar to the Xi Jinping example, that yes, you are right in saying that this has certain flaws, but if you do not provide an alternative, then this is probably the best option we have for solving a problem, I don't know, for helping a minority or help helping economic development or whatever. So in those kinds of situations, particularly when debating about policy proposals and particularly when you're on the negative side of the motion, trying to explain why something should not be proposed, try to have a clear idea of alternative ways that can solve the problem. And I'm not necessarily saying a counter problem, but just saying, okay, with this X amount of funds or resources or time or political capital fiat in the motion, there are different things we can do. There are certain things already being done in the status quo or uh, proposing this motion precludes other better solutions because they're mutually exclusive. Try to have a clear idea of what your advocacy is for solving, for solving a, certain, a, certain, uh, a certain problem. Uh, for example, I think a, a, good, a good illustration of this uh, there was a motion at Novi Sad Euros, I think that was the semi open semi-final, that, that um, all regions within countries should be granted the constitutional right to secession. And obviously then government will argue that uh, we need this, this motion because it provides people with the ability to self-determine, to actualize their identity, uh, to create like their own community and so on and so forth. I think a good alternative and a good advocacy for all would be to say, we agree with most of the things that the government has said. However, the better way to do this is to guarantee regional autonomy instead of granting the right to secession. What I, what I would run from all today, because now I'm somewhat smarter than I was then and I ran a not so good case back then, but is to say, look, most conflicts in terms of secessionist regions happen because certain requests for autonomy were not met. But requests for autonomy usually don't start as requests for independence. They start as requests for autonomy, which then evolve into requests for independence at the point where people think that autonomy cannot be met within the boundaries of that specific state. This is why you do not have secessionist conflict in Belgium and why you do not have secessionist conflict in Switzerland. But it's because these countries have institutionally created frameworks that allow for requests for autonomy to be granted within the boundaries of the state. So for example, in, in Belgium, uh, every, there are three different regional governments. Uh, they have quotas for ministers having to speak uh, the languages of, of, of the country when like moving on to the cabinet. So there needs to be a specific amount of ministers who speak French, a specific amount who speak Dutch, a specific amount who speak German. They have a heavily like decentralized system with huge power to like regional governments. Uh, the regions have the regions have their flags, they have their anthems. Uh, so for, uh, th then like, for example, uh, in, in, in Switzerland, like there are four official languages, all of these languages are taught in school and so on and so forth. So that's what I would run from up today. I would say, look, all of these, all of these benefits that government wants to get can be achieved through a different model that does not incur the specific harms of potential secession being enshrined in the constitution. And again, this is still not argumentation. I have just provided an alternative. After the alternative, I am going to then give my reasons why I think that the government proposal is bad. But my case is stronger if I don't prove that just the government proposal is bad, but I also prove that I have a way to solve their problem which doesn't incur the same harms. So that's the logic. If you're clear about your advocacy, and if you can connect the advocacy to solving the mutual problem, it makes your claims about the harms of the opposite side far stronger and far harder to take down. The third, the third thing that is uh, incredibly important in terms of framing is just not forgetting the technical stuff. In terms of there are things that you necessarily have to do in certain motions. So if it's a this house would motion and it's not an obvious policy, don't forget the model. If it's a comparative motion which says this house prefers X to Y, don't forget to compare because very often people just talk about why X is bad or good and don't compare to Y. Don't forget the technical stuff. In prep, read the motion, read the words in the motion, communicate to your partner very clearly from the start what it is that the motion requires you to prove. Do not dive into arguments, do not dive into preemptive or, or, or whatever you want to dive into before you and your partner are clear and have explicitly communicated what your burden is, what you have to prove, 
what model you're going to run, what is the counterfactual, and so on and so forth. Be clear on what the groundwork is, be clear on what you have to prove before setting out to prove it. That's a mistake that teams very often make in prep, and that's why they run impacts that sound very good, but they end up being inconsequential to the motion and stuff like this. Fourthly, and I think this is maybe the, the strongest advice I have for framing, and that's establishing and establishing very explicitly what is and what isn't comparative, i.e. don't just tell the judge what the debate is about. Tell the judge what the debate isn't about. Explicitly narrow the motion to what you want it to be about. An example of this, Cape Town World's round three. This house regrets or opposes, I don't know, the narrative that romantic love is the primary source of happiness in life. We were open in government. The frame we ran was the following. This debate is only about one group of people and no one else. We said, look, people who are happy in relationships, who have, who are dating someone, who are in marriage, they don't care about this narrative. So they're happy anyway, right? They, are, they have already accessed the benefits of love. If these people are in any way comparative, they're probably comparative on our side, because if romantic love is the primary source of happiness, then you are more protective about it. So you're gonna act controlling or you're going to enjoy your relationship less because you're going to spend time fearing about what will happen if you lose this person, blah, 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 blah. But largely they run compared. The only group of people this is comparative for are people who cannot or have not yet accessed romantic love. People who already feel some kind of deprivation and for whom this motion is going to create an even larger deprivation. Know that none of this is still a reason to propose the motion. We just had an explanation of like a minute or a minute and a half who we think the motion was about and who we think the motion wasn't about. Why? Because we realized that the strongest part, the strongest group for us to argue from government are people who are alone, people who don't have love, who want to have love and who feel very sad about that. So we, so we tried to see what we could do to narrow the debate down to this group because that was the group where arguments were strongest. That was the group that were probably winning. So if we can find a way to narrow the debate down to that group or to show that it's primarily about that group that increases significantly our chances of winning. But to do that, we had to, uh, we had to, explicitly, we had to explicitly tell the judge, look, this is what the debate isn't about. And notably, here's why it isn't about those people. It's not enough to just say, we don't think the motion is about this. You have to explain why a certain thing is uncomparative within a motion. I think another good example of this can very often be social movement motions. Because depending on how the motion is set, for example, when you have narratives within the feminist movement, this very often tend to be low impact motions outside the scope of the movement itself. So they're very impactful within the movement because people buy into that. People, uh, It's really important for people what the dominant narrative is and how people, how people uh, interact with these narratives. But very often when you talk about, I don't know, feminist narratives or some social movement narratives and impacts outside the movement, very often these impacts are small, right? Because the average guy in Croatia has absolutely no idea what the current schisms are in between feminist NGOs in Zagreb because he doesn't care and he doesn't give a shit. So very often it's useful for you to recognize that explicitly when framing the debate. I have found that very often, not always, but often, it's a useful strategy in social, uh, social uh, movements motions to say, we are perfectly happy with saying that this is a low impact motion. Here are all the things on which it doesn't impact. What it does impact is probably some kind of principle and it's probably how people within the movement feel about this. And that's what we're going to talk about because the other things are probably uncompared. It's very often useful to do this preemptively. So this is a strategy that most best probably works from open in government, right? Because by narrowing the debate down, you are also making it harder for opposition to run their case because they first have to explain, if they want to run an argument, they first have to take down your reasons, your preemptive reasons why the argument is uncomparative. And obviously closing government cannot knife you. If you very explicitly say and explain and give reasons why something is uncomparative and then closing government comes up and says, oh, but we think that is comparative, that's probably a knife. So it narrows down the situation, the situational uh, like, like uh, sp space of action for the closing. Now, obviously this also works in the reverse way. This is not something you just run from opening. This is a very useful thing to run in closing as well. Like just explaining. So if opening half has a clash that you want to put out of the debate, you think it's uncomparative. It's very often useful to spend the first two minutes of your member speech explaining why everything opening half talked about was uncomparative. 
why this is out of the debate, why this probably will not change, and then you run your case. Why is this useful? Because if you show that open half is uncomparative, then when whatever comparative case you run probably wins because open half is uncomparative. And this is again how framing sets up the groundwork for your case to work stronger. Then probably the question that arises is okay, but if we want to run this as closing and, and, and we don't want to knife our opening because opening ran, ran something stupid and now we don't know how, how not to knife it. What to do not to knife your opening? Pin it on the other side. So for so if an, so if OG has a dumb framing, OO will probably contest that framing. And then you can say, yeah, sure, OG is right. But let's assume that OO is right. Let's assume that opening government's framing is not true. We're going to win in that world as well. This allows you to avoid knifing, but still implement your case. And you are still doing it in a way that agrees with your opening. Because you phrase it in a way that says, we think they're right. However, the strategic move we're taking is to take opposition at their highest ground, take opposition at their best, assume that the different framing is true, and win within that frame. This is vastly different from saying our opening is wrong, which is knifing. However, if you frame it as we are just strategically trying to win in the best case opposition scenario, that is not knifing. So in essence, the way you phrase things, the way you say or introduce a particular type of advocacy in a debate makes a world of difference in terms of how the judge, in terms of how the judge is going to, is going to interpret that. And the last thing I want to say in terms of framing, I mean, and this is just general debating advice, but I think it's very important for framing as well. Make sure you know why you are saying things. In terms of, Teams very often when they talk about, I don't know, and this also applies for characterization, about con context, history, incentives, whatever. They very often say things that are correct. They say things that are smart, but as a judge, I'm just not sure why I care about them because they're inconsequential to the wrong. Like if the statement is true or not, makes absolutely no difference in whether this team wins. So whatever you are saying, both in terms of framing and in terms of arguments, make sure that you know why you are saying that, what the strategy behind it is, i.e., ask yourself the question, if the judge believes me that what I am saying is true, why does this help me in the round? If the judge believes that what I am saying is true, why does it make the judge more likely to vote for me? If there is no reason, no answer to that question, you should probably not be saying that sentence because it's then probably inconsequential to you winning the round. So when you are making points of framing, be it meta debating, be it incentive analysis, be it whatever, know why you are doing it. What bet, why are you trying to set that ground? Which argument are you trying to strengthen? Which argument are you trying to preemptively take out or make uncomparative from the other side? Always have a clear strategic pathway. And I think this is a very important, just like general advice for debating. When you go out to deliver your speech, you need to know what you intend to do to win. If I would stop you before your speech and I would say, now tell me how you intend to win the debate. Why do you think that your case, if proven, is the winning case? You need to have an answer to that question. And this applies for anything, for like extensions, for OG, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you end up taking the fourth. You can fourth and you can get 64, 64, and that's very sad, but you're gonna be better next time. That's not problematic. It's problematic if you go out and deliver your speech without knowing how you even intend to try to win the debate. It doesn't matter if you fail to win the debate, but you need to have an idea of how you're going to try to win it, why you are going to run the case you're going to run. And this is something I think is very useful advice, particularly for novice novice speakers are still struggling with experience and things like that. It applies to framing, but it applies to, to like just debating logic in general and how you approach debates. Let me just see if there are any new questions. Okay, so there's the motion question. Uh, yeah, so the session is recorded. Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest way you can go back and watch to find the motions. Uh, we, I also got a question about how do we narrow the motion to a certain actor without squirreling the debate? In essence, by explaining why it's legitimate to narrow it down to a particular actor. So 
very often, if you just try to say, oh, look, this motion is about actor X and not actor Z or Y without explaining the reasons why that's true, it's probably very legitimate for the other side to call you out and say, they give absolutely no explanation why we shouldn't also be debating about actor Z or Y. But if you have good and rational reasons why actor Z or Y should be excluded, that's legitimate. Because you know that you are not, and I'm going back to the example of the romantic love motion, you are not fiating them out. You did not say, we as open in government refuse to debate about these people. You said, these people, given that they exist in a context where they already have romantic love and they already have these, this happiness, they are not impacted by the narrative. So we agree that they exist within the scope of the motion. They are just not impacted by the motion. So there's a difference between you just trying to fiat something out and conveniently debating about a certain group and you explaining why that group is outside the debate. So insofar as you can provide reasons why they're out of the debate, you're probably going to be fine. Squirrels, squirrels mostly happen when people overstep their fiat. When people, where people are just like, I have arbitrarily decided to talk about this and not that without giving explanation. But insofar as you give reasons, you're going to be fine. Okay, now what I want to move on is characterization. Uh, what I've talked about so far in terms of framing was mostly like meta debating things, like how to handle burdens, how to be explicit about comparatives, how to be clear about your advocacy. When I'm gonna talk about characterization, I'm gonna talk more about how to set the context, characterize incentives, explain how people react and, and so on and so forth. Oh, but before that, there's another question. Question says, Regarding w, uh, WDC 2016, you mentioned both team one because of how he framed it in terms of the global poor being justified. In contrast, closing up argued that the justification doesn't matter if the impacts are extremely bad for the poor. How would you weigh this? Would it have been better if CEO argued in principle instead of practice? That's a good question. So I think that the CEO strategy, of, obviously I'm not gonna adjudicate that debate now, but the CEO strategy is not necessarily a bad strategy. So it is legitimate to say something is not justified if it produces harms, that is a legitimate normative statement. You can win a debate with that thing. The weighing of that clash and whether or not a team wins that clash comes down to whether you manage to explain why that's true. So if I say things are unjustified because they harm someone, I still have to explain why that is the normative statement I'm making. Why does practical harm make something principally unjustified? I need to provide a theoretical basis, a philosophical basis, for the claim I'm making. Because know that opening government and closing opposition have both made legitimate philosophical claims. Opening government said, this is legitimate regardless of the practical because we are talking about moral judgments. Closing opposition says, but a part of moral judgments is the harm that happens and we have to weigh the harm. The quality of the analysis behind both of those statements is what is going to win or lose a debate. But both of those framings were very smart. And this is why those people were in the finals of worlds. In most debates, running one of those very well is probably going to win you, to win you the round. But obviously in that debate, uh, notably open government did not just have a principal case, they also had a good practical case, which also helped the reason that they won. Uh, okay, so we have another question. Uh, when we are framing and, oh, this is the pre-Korea finals motion. When we are framing and characterizing, oftentimes this backfires with us. For example, in the motion, this house believes that the theory of communism is immoral, the prep time framing from prop will also probably involve comparisons of different systems. The characterization that comes to our mind tells us that maybe we are in the wrong side. This in turn skews our understanding of the motion and it becomes hard for us to convince ourselves of the arguments. How can we avoid this tunnel vision of bad framing during prep? Okay, so I'm not necessarily sure that this is a framing issue. I think it's more of a breaking your own biases and cognitive barriers in that sense issue. Because um, obviously if you're unconvinced of a particular idea or if you're heavily convinced against it, it's harder to find reasons why to support it. However, what you can do if, for example, opposition is more intuitive to you, like it obviously was. So, so in this case, it's, it's, it's the opposite because it's immoral. But in any case, let's say you have to prove that communism is moral and you disbelieve that and it's easier for you to argue the other side. Try to form a case by rebutting the other side in prep. Okay, so we have to prove that communism is moral. Here are the reasons that the other side is going to put forward why communism is immoral. What, what is the rebuttal we can use to that? Are there responses we can give 
to their positive material that we would run if we were in their position. And you can start building the case from rebuttal. Very often when a motion is unintuitive to you, it helps to ask yourself what the other side will run and then try to think of flaws in that, gaps in that, and start from those gaps. Because I think that tunnel vision is not a result of bad or good framing or bad or good debating skill. It's just a result of some ideas, given your personal beliefs, experience, or whatever, being more or less intuitive to you. Uh, and also in this particular motion, now regardless of tunnel vision, I'm not sure that comparing communism to different systems is good framing. And this ties into what I said earlier about reading the motion carefully, because the motion asks you to claim that something is immoral. This is an absolute statement. Communism does not become moral just because everything else is less moral. Communism is absolutely moral or it is immoral in a vacuum. The fact that I may be a bad person has nothing to do with other people being bad people. So I cannot say that I am good because everyone else is worse than me. So in this particular motion, the burden on government is to provide a normative framework of how we judge whether an ideology is moral or immoral, and then weigh communism towards that metric, regardless of the existence of other systems. The comparison of other systems would have been more useful if this were a practical motion. So in practical motions, you can say the reason why democracy is a good system is because in practice, all other systems have failed more than democracy. So we propose democracy, not because it's good, but because it's less bad. But if you're talking about morality, then you're analyzing things in the abstract, regardless of the existence of other ideologies or other belief systems, which may be moral or immoral. Another question, how would we frame this motion if we are the prop side? This house regrets the increased prominence sport, participation in sport, consuming sporting merchandise, following sport in the working class conscience. Cool. Um, so, okay, so first of all, you would have to set up a counterfactual. Um, I'm unsure what exactly is meant by working class conscience here because most individuals who follow sports statistically are working class or middle class and so far as that's the majority of people in the world. Uh, so I'm not exactly clear on what the A team wanted to do with that, but I would probably run and how I would try to frame it is if the debate is about working class conscience, then probably the implication of what prop should run is uh, the self-consciousness of, self of the working class in like a left-wing interpretation, which means like, the unity of the working class in like voting, political activism, policy advocacy, unions and whatnot. Then I would probably run that sport necessarily breaks that unity. Because I would say that sport and particularly like following sport and buying into certain like mythologies and traditions related to sport is incredibly divisive because sports rivalries are very often based on local rivalries in between parts of the country. So we have like, in Croatia, like it's the, it's the north versus the south, so it's like Zagreb versus Split. You have international rivalries. So, for example, uh, when Croatia plays Serbia, that's quite a heated match. So I suppose, and I, I mean, I cannot claim because I'm not in that region. I suppose the same is true for like if India and Pakistan play cricket or, or, or football or whatever. Uh, when Serbia plays Kosovo, that's an incredibly, or Albania, that's an incredibly heated, heated, heated situation. And I would say that probably sport given, and, and this is the, the characterization part, given the way sport works, because it encourages you to pick a side and be loyal to that side, because it encourages you to have rivalries, because it encourages you to base your identity not on your class, but rather on your, on your background, on when you were born or on your nationality, is inherently divisive and divides the working class based on variables that are unrelated to them being working class. Whereas the counterfactual we would like is for the working class to unite regardless of their other differences based on the fact that they have this particular socioeconomic stratum and act together. If people are buying into die hard mythologies of Arsenal fans and Tottenham fans hate each other, then despite the fact that they are both working class families from London, they will not want to communicate with each other because they will disqualify each other a priori based on the identity. And the characterization is then given that sport encourages 
this kind of identity construction and this kind of sectarianism, it is unconducive to any kind of collective class consciousness. I think that's generally the framework that I would attempt to run. Cool. Let's move on to characterization and advice for how to do characterization well. The first thing that's important when characterizing is to provide detailed context of the particular, maybe the best word is location, that the debate is taking place. I think probably the best example of this are IR motions. Obviously, it applies elsewhere as well, but IR motion is a good example of this. So, for example, there was a motion at UDC 2016 that Latin American countries uh, should provide extensive support for a military coup in Venezuela. So a very smart framing from government for that motion would be to explain why the context of Venezuela is such that only a military coup is a viable remaining rational alternative. So the first two minutes, two and a half minutes of the government case should be focused only on saying in, in that time, so that's 2016, look, Venezuela is currently in a quasi civil war. There are no civil liberties. The government is divided. There is huge inflation. The economy is artificially tied to oil and to China. They are incredibly dependent on that and they cannot, and they cannot move away from this. Uh, essentially, the entire political system is filled with corruption and nepotism. So if we do not create a coup, regardless of who wins, whether it's the government loyalists or the rebels or whoever, you're probably going to get a continuation of the same problems. Given the context in Venezuela, given it's a failing country, we have to go in and we have to restart it. And then it's easier to make the argument for the coup because obviously what opposition is going to run is the coup is bloody, right? This means starting a war in a country. You go in with tanks, people are going to die, buildings are going to be destroyed, there's going to be famine, there's going to be disease. And this means that from government, you have to construct a world where these do not seem so bad. You do that by providing a context where all of these things, death, hunger, disease, would happen more if we do not react. To explain this, you need to give a context of why Venezuela is spiraling towards death and hunger anyway. And the only question is whether it collapses now in a coup or whether it collapses organically in 20 years, by which time more people will have died. This is how the context of the country enables you to run the argument for your side well. Another good example of this, so Zagreb Open 2020, one of the last in-person tournaments before lockdown, there was a motion about abolishing the two schools, one roof system in Bosnia. So in essence, for people who don't know, Bosnia is an incredibly ethnically divided country. So there are three ethnicities, Croats, uh, Bosniaks, and Serbs. And in essence, uh, the, they have a divided educational system. So this means that like children go to the same school, but they are taught in different classes, they are taught different history curricula, they are taught in different, I mean, the languages are very similar, but like different literary works, different like grammatical stuff and all of this. And government obviously then runs because they have to abolish the two schools, one roof uh, system. They run combined and unified education. So all children in Bosnia have the same curriculum and so on and so forth. A very useful framework for opposition is to just explain why you can never solve ethnic tensions in Bosnia. Because the logic of government, probably the argument that government runs, is if we educate children in, in a unified curriculum, in the long term, we can create a political culture where we have a unified national identity rather than ethnic uh, sectarians. Opposition will probably run why this is very traumatic for, for children, why there's probably going to be like parents are going to disagree, there's going to be bullying, blah, blah, blah. blah. But you can also preemptively use framing and characterization to take out any kind of government case that says that we're going to solve or, or, or decrease ethnic tensions in Bosnia. You have six reasons why those tensions are never going to be solved and why the country is going to remain divided. If you do that, no, this is not tied to the motion. I'm explaining why Bosnia is irrevocably divided. That's not a reason to oppose the motion, but it's a reason why the government argument doesn't stand. And this is again how providing characterization, which is not necessarily an argument for your side, but simply creates a world, describes a world where given that the world looks like this, the other side's argument cannot be true. It makes it easier for you to win <coughs> and to run your arguments. I think that this most often happens in IR debates, but also happens in other debates as well. So in essence, about setting up the context, setting up a world that fits your advocacy, helps your advocacy. The second thing that's very important in terms of characterization 
is incentive analysis, right? Because in many motions, we just have to explain in order to get their impacts, how actors will behave and why they will behave that way. And very often debates are won or lost based on who manages to convince the panel more or less that people are going to behave in a certain way. Uh, I'm going to give you three questions that I think can be used as rules of thumb to analyze why and how incentives exist and are formed. There are three questions you can ask yourself. First, and I think this one is obvious, is what does the actor want? So every actor has certain, uh, has certain motivations, every actor has certain wishes, every actor has certain desires. Even if you don't know a lot about the actor, you can always infer some general ones. So even if it's a country you don't know a lot about, uh, most countries want independence, so not to not be dependent on other countries. Most countries want, I mean, all countries, want economic development, all countries want peace instead of war, and so on and so forth. If it's a person you know nothing about, you can conclude that every human being probably wants happiness, every human being probably wants to not be poor, every human being needs their, needs their like basic needs satisfied, and so on and so forth. But the first question is therefore, what does a particular actor want? And note that there is a hierarchy here. Actors can want multiple things, but they can want one thing more than the other. So very often, you're going to have to explain why an actor is going to prioritize one thing over the other, i.e. the most basic example is in like any kind of surveillance debate, why people will or will not want to prioritize security over privacy and why one is more important to them than the other. You're trying to explain this from the perspective of the actor, obviously, right? How people think and so on and so forth. But the question is, what does the actor want and what is the hierarchy of the thing that the actor wants? And the second question ties into this, and this is how far is the actor willing to go to get it? Because you may want something, but there are certain barriers that you're not willing to cross to get that thing, because at that point, the cost benefit trade off becomes unprofitable for you. I'm going to give a hypothetical example. Obviously, it's a stupid example and it's never going to happen anywhere, but they just like to illustrate things. So let's say you are a disenfranchised group of any sort. You're a member of a disenfranchised group. And someone tells you, starting tomorrow, you're going to stop being disenfranchised. You're going to get all of the privileges that the majority group has in terms of politics, education, social relationships, but you have to sacrifice your child for that. Obviously, it's never going to happen. Like just making up an example. Most people would say no, because they have a preference to stop being disenfranchised, but they have a higher preference to support and maintain the needs and the well being of their loved ones. So the question is how far is the actor willing to go to get something? Because there are some barriers which they cannot cross. I think an opposite of this is that there are some actors who are willing to go very far. So, for example, I think a very good example of this is religious fundamentalism. So, we're talking things like ISIS or like Al Qaeda or the Al Nusra Front. Fundamentalism, in essence, means that. In, in religious terms, means that you are convinced that you are worshiping God in the exact way that God would want to be worshipped. This means that you know the path to salvation. You're absolutely positive that you know the path to salvation and that you are on the path to salvation. You also know that, therefore, people who do not believe the same way as you are not on the path to salvation. And you have a duty to inform them of the path to salvation because knowing the path and not disclosing the path to others is probably a very bad sin which means that these people are prepared to go very far to achieve their goals, including sacrificing their life. The example of this being suicide bombers, because they believe that they are pursuing a goal that's higher than life. This is why very often you cannot negotiate with terrorist groups. You cannot negotiate about certain territories, because if a territory is holy, you are not just giving up, up a piece of land. You are giving up something that was given to you into heritage by God, and you are literally trading and bartering with it. You cannot trade within holy territory, but something that is holy for one person is not holy for the other person. So depending on the characteristics of the actor, they're going to have different positions on particular issues. Another good example of this is any revolution ever. So the French Revolution, where the sans went went like, literally like, that's why they're called sans culottes, with naked butts to fight like the French army, uh, have, have a bunch of Marxist revolutions, like have like the, the partisans, the Tito's partisans in, in World War II, who in essence were like villagers who 
like stole rifles from the local armory and went on to fight the Nazis. You have like, for example, the protests in Hong Kong as well, because it's a huge asymmetry of power, like, like the, the, the police, the China is against them. Uh, if they're beating them up on the streets. They're protesting against an authoritarian regime and stuff like this. They're still doing it. Why? Because they're willing to go the length. They value freedom over physical safety. Some actors have a red line that they're not willing to cross. Other actors are willing to cross barriers that for others among us would be red lines. So the question when you're an incent analyzing the incentives of an actor is to ask yourself, does the actor have red lines? What are those red lines and for which issues? That this is a very important question to me. And I think the third question is what irrationalities influence them? Uh, because People, and this is also my problem with uh, with uh, with r r rational choice theory, but that's a completely different rant. Um, people do not act as rational uh, maximizers of utility because people are not completely rational. They do not make the objectively based choice for themselves based on their certain beliefs. And I think a lot of the things I've said tie into the examples I gave before. So um, based on your value judgment. So for example, for an atheist, it is completely irrational to sacrifice your life for religious goals. If you're a fundamentalist, it's not, but also it's on a more basic level. So if I am angry, I will make different decisions than if I am calm. If I am very sad, I will make different decisions than when I am happy. Emotions are by definition irrational. So if an actor is, I don't know, particularly pissed at something, particularly devoted to something, particularly pleased about something, particularly whatever about something, this probably affects their decision-making calculus. So you have to ask yourself what the emotions of the actor are. Are there any irrational influences on the mind of that actor? Is that actor currently in a state of mind that they would do something that most people in a normal situation would not? Because very often that also happens in debates. So that's the third question. So to summarize the questions, the first one is, what does the actor want? The second, and, and what is the hierarchy of those ones? The second one is, how far are they willing to go to get it? And the third is, what irrationalities are influencing the actor? Okay, there are two more things I want to mention before opening the four questions. Uh, the third thing, which also helps, I think, actor analysis, is analysis of power, locuses of power. So obviously, we know that actors have incentives, they have motivations, and they uh, have certain things they want to get. However, whether or not they're going to get it depends on the power they wield. Do they have enough power? Do they have enough influence to actually be able to get the things they want? Again, I'm going to give you three, let's say, uh, frameworks to which you can analyze power. And I'm going to use uh, a, a term, a concept from political sociology called the three phases of power. Because I think the very good way to analyze where power lies in society is to just see who has power and which face of power it corresponds. So the first most transparent, most active face of power is coercive power, which is in the most basic definition, the ability of actor A to make actor B do what actor A wants, even if it's not in actor B's interest. So this means that even if you don't want to do something, I have the power to make you do it because I can coerce you in some way through punishment, through money, through physical coercion, whatever. The most obvious example of this is, the, is the, the, mono, the monopoly the state has on physical violence. The state has coercive power because if you do not listen to the state, they're going to send the police, the police is going to beat you up and lock you away in jail. And you cannot resist the state because comparatively to the state, you do not have firepower. You cannot resist the full police force of the state. You cannot resist the army of the state as an individual citizen, which means that in terms of the things you want to do within a state, you are limited by the fact that the state can use its power against you at the point where you breach the boundaries the state has set. So the state has the boundary setting power because it has the coercive power. So the first question is, where does the active coercive power lie? Who has more capacity to coerce other individuals because they hold more tools and chips in their arsenal, be it weaponry, be it economic coercion or whatever. The second thing is agenda setting power. And this is the hidden face of power. And this is the ability to regulate what is even talked about and what even reaches the public docket. I, the most obvious example are parliaments, because obviously the ruling party in parliament or the most numerous parties in parliament 
have more of a capacity to control what parliament is going to vote on because they can propose bills that are actually going to get passed which means that they control what is on the docket and what is even going to become a political issue. Other examples of this are, let's say, famous individuals, people who have clout, who are listened to. For example, uh, literary artists, uh, singers, actors, who we consider to be important uh, people in society, or certain social movement leaders, who by raising an issue, by raising their voice about a particular question, can make this a social question everyone, everyone talks about. Because if I am very committed about, I don't know, a particular NGO 100 kilometers south of Zagreb, and I go onto the main square and I yell about this NGO, nobody's going to listen to me. The, the, maybe someone is going to think I'm crazy. A lot of people are going to think I'm crazy, but nobody's going to listen to me. However, if Hugh Grant comes up and makes a commercial about this NGO 100 kilometers south of Zagreb, I think a lot of people around the world are going to donate. But because when he says it, he has the agenda setting power because people are emotionally attached to him because he has the outreach, the ability to access media, the ability to access modes of communication, the connections. He can talk to other people who are famous. He can talk to politicians or whoever, which means that he can, if he, if he talks about this issue that this NGO is dealing with, he's going to set the agenda, not just in Croatia, but outside of Croatia as well, because he can reach those people. He can convince those people. I will not set the agenda even for the main square, even though we're making the same argument. But that's because he has the agenda setting power. His words are listened to and mine are not. This also works for religious leaders because they can frame things in terms of like religious virtue or religious sin. This also works for political leaders who are, for example, revolutionaries or have participated in important historical events in the country. So for example, if a country has recently gained independence, like for example, in the Balkans, uh, People have, politicians have participated in the war who are war veterans are more listened to than those who are not because they are perceived to be uh, people who are devoted to the country, have the country's best interest in mind. And this means they can convince the people more and so on and so forth. And the last phase of power is the power to shape preferences. It's not just about what is being, what, what we are discussing in society and what's a political issue, but in convincing people what they want and what they don't want. The most obvious example is marketing in capitalism. So commercials and the way commercials are designed, and this is even more uh, pernicious in today's world where Facebook literally gather, get, and Google literally gather all our metadata and they cross-reference our behavior. They literally know uh, how much time we spent on a particular post. They calculate how, what type of content you liked and they, and they create targeted advertisements based specifically on your psychological profile. This is the power to shape references, right? This is the power to influence people's preferences so that they want something or believe that they want something and, do, and not want something else. If you can do that, you do not need agenda setting power because the people themselves will have different conceptions of what they want on the agenda. And if their conceptions of what they want on the agenda align with yours, then you don't need agenda setting power because you convinced people that something is best for them. I think. The power to shape preferences also very often applies to some of the people or to most of the people to whom agenda setting power applies. Because a very popular actor is probably going to have some amount of preference shaping power. A strong religious leader who is seen as virtuous and pure is probably going to have a lot of preference shaping power because he's seen as the person who can interpret scripture and interpret what is good or wrong. A political leader who is perceived to be the father of the nation has a lot of preference shaping power because his opinion is thought to be wise. He has experienced more, he has bled for this country and he knows what is in the country's best interest. And if he says this is in the country's best interest, then maybe it is, maybe we should listen to him because he's wise and he cares about us. So agenda setting power and preference, and preference uh, shaping power very often overlap. But preference shaping power is the most, uh, most pernicious and most influential of all of these. And I think if you analyze in society where power lies, who has power and what phase of power it corresponds to and combine this with the incentive analysis I gave you, it's probably a very strong way to characterize actors and then explain why they're gonna behave in the way. They do. And the last thing I want to say is please don't forget that debates are about real people. I mean, not in the sense that the motions are happening to real people, but you are talking about real people. Very often, teams discuss situations that are incredibly everyday situations 
And if you were talking about a, uh, like over a beer, about those situations, you would literally be able to talk and rant for two hours. But then when you talk about it in a debate, you sound incredibly like vague and generic and you cannot characterize. So always remember that this is a real life situation for someone. Imagine how that person feels. How do they react? What emotions do they experience at the point where something happens? So like the most obvious example here, like education motions. For example, this house believes that a school should teach children to be skeptical of parental authority. Imagine an average child. We were all children. We all had our desires, our doubts, our quirks, our happy and sad moments. How does an average child react when a teacher tells them this or that? And then take the judge, like literally take the judge step by step through the mental process. How does the person interact with other people and with information they get from the outside world? What emotions does this cause? How does this compel them to act? Very often, just putting yourself in the position of the actor you're talking about and asking yourself the question, okay, let's get down to earth. Let's cut out all like the debating crap, comparatives, delta or whatever. How would this actor react to this particular stimulus? Just reminding yourself that that's the core question of the debate will make your prep a lot better at the point where you consciously remind yourself of that. Because I would say that debating is in essence a social experiment, right? You imagine you take a person, like you imagine a hypothetical person, you take a motion, you do the motion to the person, and then you discuss about what, what the person is going to do. It's like literally you put a person in like a social laboratory and you're experimenting. Like if we give them this motion, how are they going to act? If we give them this incentive, how are they going to act? Think of debating as a social experiment, right? So if you take a person and you put them in the world of emotion, how are they going to interact with that world? What has changed in their world as opposed to the status quo? And how do they interact with this realistically? How does this make them feel? How does this change, change their motivations? I think it very often just helps to ground yourself, like remind yourself that you're talking about real human beings, like get away for a moment from the minutiae of, you know, debating lingo and whatever, and just think about how real people would react to a particular emotion. I think it's very good to consciously remind yourself of that in prep. So that's essentially it. I'm opening the floor to questions now, but there's already, there's, 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 there's a new question in the chat already. Uh, so could you please also list some of your favorite reading, podcast, YouTube, and other sources to be able to make better framings and arguments, but also just to be able to think in the manner world-class debaters do in prep. Okay, so I don't have a particular list of this. Um, I know that a lot of people, and I think this is just an individual preference. I know a lot of people have podcasts they listen to before tournaments. I know a lot of people do uh, matter files, like case files and stuff like that. I don't do any of those. Um, usually what I do in terms of just generating information for characterization is I try to make my social media accounts more or less a news platform. So obviously on Facebook, um, if you, the more you like certain news sources, the more news articles are going to pop up from those news sources. So if you like a lot of articles from The Guardian and from the BBC, you're going to get a lot of articles from The Guardian and from the BBC. So what I'm essentially trying to do is transform my Facebook feed into a news feed to like enough content on what interests me the most or what I think I need to know more about. So if I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, just, I have a, let's say I have a deficit in knowledge about, I don't know, let's say that world is happening in uh, Guatemala and I have a lack of knowledge about Guatemala. I'm going to like more sources about Guatemala and try to find out more info about Guatemala. But what I, what I essentially do, given that my, my social media feed is a news feed, I go through the news and when I see something that's very interesting to me or something I don't know anything about, I read the article and then I research that specific topic. So I do targeted research. I try to inform myself of like what the current news headlines are, what the current trains of thought are in particular branches of philosophy, of literature, whatever. And then I do targeted research on the things that interest me the most or the things that I, I think I need to know more about and stuff like this. So I don't have a specific list of content I knowingly consume. I rather try to make my social media a diverse set of content, which I then access in a targeted way, depending on what piques my interest or depending on whether I think this is something very important I should know more about. I think that in, in, if you do want uh, like a specific type of advice in terms of content you can watch, I would recommend watching workshops given by debaters. So for example, uh, the Scottish EUDC training platform can be found on YouTube. They had a lot of very good, uh, very good workshops. Uh, Astana UDC also had workshops which were published on the Astana UDC Facebook page. 
Athens also had workshops delivered at various academies like the Mediterranean uh, Debating Academy. And these are not just the workshops about debating things like framing and characterization or like, I don't know, winning promoji or like how to do an extension, but they are also content workshops. So people who know about a particular topic are explaining that topic. So Lovro, my partner who studies economics, gives a, a one and a half hour workshop on how to debate economics. And I know that Ilya from Serbia gave, gave a workshop on how to debate debates about the Balkans because he's from the Balkans and he knows a lot about this. So this is a way in which you can learn a lot of content and immediately have it framed in a debate manner because these people are also going to give you example motions. They're also going to give you example arguments. And this is a very good way to combine like, like prepping for debates, but also learning more about the world and gaining knowledge that you can use outside of debating as well. And I think the last thing in terms of learning framing is just watch a lot of debates because you can, you can learn a lot from excellent debaters. Which is like, I think a very good debating exercise uh, regardless of, of, um, of framing and characterization is to just watch a debate and critically analyze it. And this means not just watch it and listen to it, but also interact with the content, by which I mean you take a debate and you listen to the PM, and then you pause the debate. And you Hopefully you have written down, so you write down the PM speech as if you were flowing, as if you were a judge. You write down the speech in detail. You pause the debate. You take a look at the arguments. If this person is using some words or terms you don't know, Google these words or terms. Do they have any flaws in their arguments? So if you have something you would add to the argument, write that down. Uh, how would you rebut the argument? Do you have any ideas how you could respond to the argument? Write that down as well. Because this makes you not just like listen to the content, but you also actively interact with the content and you memorize it, but you also personalize it. Because insofar as you're going to take some bits from the argument, you're going to tweak some bits, you're going to respond to some bits, you're making your own version of the argument that is best suited to your knowledge and your style. Then you continue watching the run, take a look at LO, and you do the same for LO. Write down the speech, uh, research the things you don't know about, see what are the flaws, what you would add or subtract. You can compare LO's rebuttal to your rebuttal. So did LO use some of the things you would have used in response? Did they use some other things? Why did they use them? And you can do that for entire debates. And like this, you're going to pick up a lot of argumentation, you're going to pick up a lot of framing, but you can rehash in later debates, but also tweak it in a way that suits you the best, your knowledge, your style, and the way in which you like to make arguments. So this is a very good advice for people trying to, trying to improve. Uh, okay, are there any other questions? Just gonna wait for like 15, 20 seconds. Uh, cool. It seems there are no further questions. So, oh, 